Welcome to EdgeEd Interactive. This is our uh, third, I think, event of 2017. Uh, we've got Silvia Martinez with us tonight, and she's going to be talking about the E in STEM, which, as we all know, isn't really part of the curriculum, but on the other hand, um, is in, in, incredibly important for the economy um, and really could be used as a glue to hang together the different parts of the curriculum. Let me spend a couple minutes talking a little bit about EdChat Interactive and the platform that we're using, uh, and then introduce Sylvia. So uh, first of all, let me expand this. Uh, first of all, EdChat Interactive. Uh, our whole purpose is to pull together people who are doing really interesting things in education and provide a forum for them to share them with others. Um, I'm sure that you've all taken webinars before, um, our purpose with EdChat Interactive is to is kind of a webinar version too, to make it a lot more interactive and a lot more aligned with the way adults learn. And uh, you'll be seeing the interactivity uh, during the course of the evening. Let me explain it a little bit because we're using the Shindig platform, uh, and Shindig is going to be a little bit different from other platforms that you've probably used. Uh, first of all, you notice that you have an avatar kind of floating around on the screen. Underneath your avatar are two buttons. There's the raise hand button. Uh, there's going to be a couple times where we ask, can we have a volunteer to come up on stage? Uh, and if you're willing to volunteer, you'll click the raise hand button, in which case I'll see you and I can move you up on stage. And then the ask button is a way for you to ask questions. If uh, uh, Sylvia brings something up and that triggers a question, uh, click on the ask question, ask that question. I'll pass it on to Sylvia and uh, we'll get it answered for you. So those are the first two buttons, raise hand and ask button, and the ask button. Uh, the third way of interacting is through what we call, what uh, Shindy calls IMing. Now, when you move your cursor over your avatar, you'll see a five item menu, like the one on the screen. And one of those items is called IM. I'd like you to click it now, and that'll bring up a dialog box, and it'll, it'll allow you to share uh, text information with the other people in, in the room. And maybe you can use it now to uh, to type in where you're from and um, maybe something that you've done with problem-based learning or with making that you can share with the others. So move your cursor over your avatar, click on that IM button to open up the dialog box and type in something to introduce yourself, where you're from, and uh, what's something that you've done with making or uh, project-based, problem-based learning. And then the final way of interacting is something that's unique to Shindig, and that allows you to, to work in small groups. Uh, you can click on the avatar of any other person who's here, and assuming that you both have microphones and webcams, uh, you can talk to each other in private. Nobody else can hear it other than whoever is in that conversation. So um, normally uh, we'd give you a chance to do that right now. I, I know we're going to be doing it during the course of Sylvia's presentation. So I think we're going to skip this uh, in my intro. Uh, but uh, you see the avatars of the other people and you understand that you can click on them and talk to somebody else who's here. I uh, also want to say that next week we're going to have a, uh, a session with Kathy Glass on strategies for teaching argumentation in writing. Uh, I think we've all become um, upset at the way uh, arguments are being made in politics and in current events today. Um, and what I'm hoping is that we can train the next generation how to have more cogent ar arguments that are based on facts and logic rather than the name calling and character assass assassination that we're seeing um, in the world at large today. And Kathy Glass knows how to teach those skills to students. So I'd like to encourage you to sign up for her session on February 16th and learn how to teach your students how to make cogent arguments. And now I'd, uh, I'd like to bring up uh, Sylvia. And I will say that Sylvia comes to us uh, through FETC. 
uh, Sylvia was a, a featured speaker at FPTC, and as shown here, she's an author, um, she's a keynoter, she's an engineer, she's a teacher, and she has persisted. So let me bring up Sylvia. Hi. Hi, Mitch. So, Very timely. Welcome back to <laughs> Welcome back to EdChat Interactive. Well, thank so, you. Glad to be back. So, what do you have behind you? Those I'm just noticing now all of those boxes. <laughs> yes, this is the the maker um, uh, closet that that uh, we work from to go on the road. So, different workshops, we pull out the makey makeys or the the you know Arduinos or whatever. I just was I I just picked up a whole box of lily pads because I'm doing a e-textile workshop in Canada next week. One week from today, the Calgary City, City Teachers Conference, um, we're going to be doing e-textile workshops. So it's kind of like making sure uh, that all the stuff was there. I mean, typical stuff, right? You, you get home from a workshop, you put things on a shelf, and then you open the box and go, it's a mess. You know, got to fix it. So that's what, I, that's what I've been doing today. Wow. Well, it kind of beats me. I've been uh, shoveling. Uh, we got uh, we got snow here on the east coast, as as you know, and uh, here just outside of New York, uh, we got about ten inches, um, or I guess um, about what twenty uh, twenty two twenty three centimeters. <laughs> um, so uh, so I I got to shovel. I got my exercise. Well, you can so tell let from me my pull myself down, and I'm, I'll bring uh, your slides up. And Okay. Oh no, go ahead. So from your your t-shirt that you're, you're I was just you're saying not cold. I'm in Los Angeles. I am not shoveling snow. I'm uh, I'm. It's probably cold for here. Probably sixty degrees. You know, I know people are just like so sad for for me that it's so cold here in Los Angeles. Um, <laughs> sorry about that. <laughs> Okay, so I'll bring up your slides now. Perfect, thank you. So hi everybody, um, my name is Sylvie Martinez and we're going to be talking today about the E in STEAM, that's engineering of course, um, and people all over the world are saying STEAM, STEM, it's so important, but for a lot of schools, that E is kind of a mystery. So that's what we're going to be talking about today. What is engineering? How does it fit into curriculum? And how do you teach it when, you know, your day is full already? So Mitch, next slide. Uh, if you know me, um, you probably know me from a book called Invent to Learn, uh, Making to Bring an Engineering in the Classroom. And this is a book that uh, I wrote along with Gary Steger to talk about the intersection of making and the maker movement with schools. And the maker movement is something that's brought a lot of really interesting technology and tools at a very reasonable price point. Things like 3D printers, rapid prototyping uh, machines like CNC and fabrication machines, um, microcontrollers, and a lot of new programming languages that are perfect for teaching engineering concepts, science concepts, math concepts. So the book tries to build a bridge on how these things can be used in schools and um, the, the ways that they really support real learning, the way we know kids learn, you know, through deep time spent on interesting projects. Um, and by the way, the InventToLearn.com website, you can find a lot of resources. And uh, if you go to the next slide, Mitch, um, there, it's also part of a lineup from Constructing Modern Knowledge Press that has a lot of books by educators who are doing making in the classroom, uh, K3 making, uh, all different kinds of making in the classroom, and there's a, a, a brand new book called Making Science that's by a middle school teacher, science teacher, who teaches in a makerspace in her room. So all of these books and ideas are about integrating the STEM subjects and making it possible for schools to do them in ways that are engaging for kids, really relevant for modern day 
uh, math and science, and of course, jobs and, and careers. So next, next Mitch. Just for a little bit of historical concept, the word engineer is actually not that old. Um, it, it dates back to about the 1400s when engineer meant an operator of an engine. And the word engine is actually from the Latin meaning a clever invention. So throughout history, engineers have always been associated with, with inventions and making things work. But even so, the word, the word engineer is older than the word scientist. You know, when we look at STEM, the oldest thing in STEM is mathematics. The newest thing is actually science and technology, because technology doesn't mean just computers. Technology means anything in the designed world. So science is actually one of the newest words in STEM, um, because before the 1800s, they were called natural philosophers. And they were typically, you know, rich people who just sort of dabbled in figuring out how the world works. The idea of a scientist that that's today's scientist is actually a very new idea. Um, and next slide, Mitch. Engineering was taught primarily by um, if your father was built churches, you built churches. If your father built pyramids, you built pyramids. It was very much something that was handed down in oral and, and sometimes written, written uh, traditions. This, these are our cards from the 1700s in England that explain, they're actually playing cards that explain how to make things like quadrants and, you know, and machines and those and wheels. Um, and that's the way that information was disseminated. So next slide. Teaching engineering is something fairly new. After the apprenticeships, um, it really wasn't included in most classical education because most people who went to school or had tutors were rich people. And rich people didn't have jobs. Rich people had other people do things for them. So things like, you know, medicine just didn't, wasn't taught in a very classical education. In the 1800s, the university system started to come in both Europe and, and the United States. Um, but engineering was still a, something very um, unique. Most universities taught following this classical model. Young men of means learned how to be witty and, and quote the classics, and um, they didn't have jobs. Before the Civil War in the United States, there were only two engineering schools in the country, uh, Rensselaer Polytechnic, which still exists today, and West Point. And they actually divided into two branches of engineering. West Point did military engineering, and Rensselaer did civilian engineering, which was that anything else that wasn't for the military. And so the first branch of engineering born, civil engineering. Now there's hundreds of branches of engineering, electrical, mechanical, bio, medical engineering. Um, all of these different aspects are looked at with an engineering point of view. But still, you know, in the bigger scheme of things, in 1870, the engineer, there were 100 engineering graduates in the United States. Today, there's about 100,000 engineering graduates who graduate from a four-year college. Now, that sounds like a lot, but really, um, that's, you know, in, in the scheme of things, 300 million U.S. citizens, that's not a lot of engineers. So when we look at teaching engineering K-12, we're really thinking about um, you know, why and how we're teaching engineering. Now, back when, again, historically, there was a committee of 10 in 1892 who decided what all U US high schools should teach. And really, this was based on still an elite notion of what universities should teach. Because at the time, only 5% of the United States um, people even went to high school. So, it looks very much like what a, what a rich person would have been educated in in the 1600s, 1700s, uh, mathematics, sciences, Western history, Latin, Greek, an overview of literature. But professional studies were not part of a high school or even a college education at the time. You'll notice that high school does not include courses in medicine or engineering or law because these were about jobs. 
uh, and still today, fewer than 10% of US high schools teach a formal course called engineering. So when we think about STEM, where does that leave us? Um, we don't want to just say, well, it's never been done before, so we can't do it. We're acknowledging that it's important. So next slide, Rich. Um, when we talk about STEM, we have a lot of science in school, maybe not as much as people would want, but they're typically the traditional natural sciences, uh, biology, physics, and chemistry, and more, more recently, earth, space, and environmental sciences have been added to the typical high school curriculum and middle school sometimes. The definition of engineering, and this is from the, um, uh, sorry, the K-12 Science Ed Education National Resource Council says that engineering is engagement in a systemic practice of design, and notice that word design, that's going to keep coming up, to achieve solutions to particular human problems. And then technology, what's that T? It's human-made systems and processes. Sometimes they call it anything in the designed world, which means that we really need to think in schools beyond computers. For many schools, technology has just come to mean computers, when in reality, it's much more. So here we're expanding not only the, the T in, in STEM, but the E in STEM, and asking schools to do more. Now, do schools have to teach nuclear, how to make a nuclear reactor and how to build a tractor and you know everything in between? I, I don't think so. But I think we do need to think a little bit more about technology as being more than just using Google and, you know, and, and Microsoft Word. Um, so next, next slide, Mitch. Typically, what's been called engineering in high school has four goals. Uh, number one is to prepare students for research in engineering fields. Uh, number two, to prepare students for employment to get a job. Number three, to prepare students to be literate, to understand the complex world we're living in. And number four, to give students relevant, interesting, challenging activities that are grounded in the real world that they can, that they can work on today. So next slide, Nick. What you see is, is that creates sort of a pyramid. At the top of the pyramid, there are very few people who are going to end up doing research in engineering fields. There are a few more who are going to get jobs as engineers, but everybody is going to be a citizen. And hopefully most people are going to be, you know, interested in the scientific world, in the, in the design world. And even more so, we have students who are today in front of us. So next slide, Mitch. I think one of the most important parts of engineering is to target this bottom of the pyramid, the most number of people who want to, are interested in science, Kids say they're interested in science, adults are interested in science, and yet in school, a lot of it is focused on this top level, this very academic -y, research oriented study that really doesn't represent what people are interested in and what it, it, it interests and excites students today as they're in school. So let's, let's go one more slide. There's another reason to include engineering in school today, and that's the next generation science standards. A lot of people say, well, we're doing science, that's fine. Engineering is just kind of like real world science, applied science. But the next generation science standards has some very interesting language, and you have to look all the way to the end, to the appendix one, to find out what they're talking about when they mean engineering. And the next generation science standard says it's a commitment to integrate engineering design into the structure of science in education by raising engineering design to the same level as scientific inquiry. So we're doing pretty good in schools with scientific inquiry. We understand how to teach science. We talk to kids about testing and, and you know, analysis and independent variables and scientific model. But engineering design is different. And the next generation science standards actually does a pretty good job of laying out what engineering design looks like. I'm not going to go through every grade level, so next slide. They um, go through the bands and define what engineering design looks like at every grade level. So there's a K-2 band. Next slide, Mitch. Um, 
there's a, there's a six eight, there's a nine twelve, and it it expands the definition what should be happening at the various grade levels. Gives examples. It's very good, um, and this is these next generation science standards are being adopted by states um, throughout the United States. It's not Common Core because as we all know, Common Core is only math and English language arts, and a lot of people worry that things like science and engineering. Um, math, so engineering and technology get left behind because everyone's focused on the two parts that are uh, that are tested. Um, so the, the big idea, I think, the the, the one takeaway from the next generation science standards are the next slide, Mitch, is that engineering is not the same as the scientific method. Engineering is a design process. And the scientific method is a testing process. So when we talk about kids going out into the world and inventing the future and understanding that they can be the change uh, you know, that the world needs to see, we're talking about designing things that don't exist today. And that's engineering. So I think that we can take a lot of the energy about design thinking, about the maker movement, and focus it and say, how do we turn this into engineering in our existing science and math classes? So part of what the science class has to do is make a little bit of room and say, not teach only a testing process for things that have already been invented and you just want to understand if their things are true or not, um, but make room for an invention, a design process that's engineering. So. I wanted to stop. I've been talking for a little while. Um, next slide, Mitch. We can um, use these, the wonderful features of this platform and have a little conversation about what's going on in your school as you tackle this sort of E in, in STEM. You know, can Mitch, I just why don't you... Okay, I just have a yeah, sure. question. Because you talked about you know, design theory and you talked about the, sci you know, the scientific method. What about computational mm -hmm. thinking? What, what, what's it you know because you see that I see that term all the time how does that relate to either the scientific method or um, design so I, I think computational thinking is something that people um, want to try and bring into schools because programming has become very important programming can be done in an engineering sense programming can be done to support science or math um, programming really goes, I think, is a platform that every STEM subject is built on. And computational thinking is a way to approach sort of a, a uh, it's a practical way to look at problems that are too hard to actually program, right? Because sometimes things, you know, you'd have to spend years being, being, getting very good at a particular programming language before you can tackle some problems. But you can use logical thinking and this sort of discrete mathematics, this binary logic of if this happens, then I should do this. If that happens, then something else happens, which also applies to if I read a light sensor and I find a value that's a certain thing, I will then turn on a, a light. So, you know, computational thinking can be used when you want to sort of, you know, make a more general argument about, um, programming and you, you you know you may not have have the the time to get there so i think computational thinking um actually i think the best way to teach computational thinking is to use certain programming languages that are easy to learn um rather than just remove computers from computational thinking but um i, I think it goes across all stem areas okay well thank you so um i'm going to bring back your slide with the question in a second and, sure. what, um, and uh, what I'd like to encourage people to do then is if you have a webcam, and I see that a couple of you do, um, click on the avatar of somebody else who has a web, webcam and uh, you know, talk about that question. If you don't have a webcam, then uh, if you again, if you move your cursor over your avatar, you get that IM um, option. And so... So I'd like you to encourage you to open that IM box and through texting uh, talk to people about um, you know the answer to the question how how you uh, 
you're seeing projects with, with STEM in your school. Now there is one person I see who's using a tablet and what you can do is if you click on the ask button and you have comments, you can type those comments into me and I can post them so that other people can see them. So let me uh, stop my broadcast, bring up the question and encourage you to interact with each other on Sylvia's question. You know, um, I was just thinking it since we're, we're both back up here, you know, one of the ways that I, that I know some schools are you, you deploying that E is in something, you know, the 20% time, uh, which is kind of made famous by Google, which is, um, in, you know, so I'm going to give my description of it and then you can correct me because I'm sure I, I have part of it wrong. But it's basically letting the students find problems that interest them. Um, and they could be problems that help the students learn certain learning objectives as well. Um, and then encouraging and helping those students actually solve those problems. Uh, so is that something, are you seeing schools deploying that? And was my description of it correct? Yes, I think it's called a lot of different things. Genius hour, some people even call it like Google time or, you know, something like that. Um, you know, I think it's a good idea. I always think kids should have agency. I think that if you try and say that this is the only time that they ever get to choose anything, then, then I think maybe you need to ask right. why it's so segregated. You know, if, if this is a great idea, why aren't we trying to, to do it more? Um, I also see that a lot of people are, are trying things without some of the design elements that if a kid has an idea, you just say, go for it. And mm -hmm. kind of, I don't think teachers are really thinking hard about the design process and the engineering process, which, which I'm gonna talk a little more about, uh, is, has some specific attributes to it. Um, and I've also seen some teachers say things like, well, I tried it and nothing happened. You know, I told the kids they could do whatever I wanted and nothing happened. I think there's there's a lot more skill as a teacher involved to curate good materials, to find interesting prompts and challenges. Not that everything has to come from you, but it's not just sort of throw up your hands and say, oh, the kids are so smart, they'll do amazing things. Um, now, sometimes teachers my, my say kids. that, well, <laughs> you know, but sometimes you hear teachers say that and, and then you ask them, well, what did you do? And they have all this list of how they prepared and the materials they use. And, you know, it was very thoughtful. And then they, they, they say something like, oh, and then I just let the kids go. It's like, oh, you're not telling the whole truth, you know? So I think it, there's preparation involved that, um, you know, we should think about. Okay, and, and I also want to point out that Kathy Walensky uh, did post um, that uh, in her school, um, they're adding an engineering unit to each grade for K to four science, which I, you know, that's, that's, cool. some, yeah, that's a great idea. Uh, thank you, Kathy. And then other people, uh, you know, please post your own ideas. Um, and we can also ask if, you know, if somebody has a webcam on their computer, uh, would you mind talking about, you know, raise, you know, click on that raise hand button. And would you mind talking about some of the things that are going on in your school? Uh, if not, then I'll bring myself down and uh, and we'll we'll pull your slides up. Let's keep on going. <laughs> uh, so yeah, it looks looks like we have a, a shy group tonight. So uh, we'll give them an, we'll give you all another chance again. Uh, Russell, up your courage because uh, it is fun, and as you know with your with your kids, I mean the best way to learn is to participate. Uh, if somebody's just sitting there in the corner, probably. Um, they're not learning as much as the, as the ones who are participating. Let me pull your slides up and we'll uh, sure. continue. So, wait, we're back. Okay. So, you know, there are definitely some core ideas of engineering design. It's not just about putting your hands on something or making anything. I think in a lot of cases, you know, we look at little kids and we say, oh, they're natural engineers. Look at them in the sandbox. They're, they're learning about stability and balance and cause and effect. And they're, they're, isn't that cute? 
And then about third grade, we say, well, now we have to get serious. And, and we forget that this play should evolve into a tinkering, a challenge, you know, moving what's, what the play of childhood into, you know, these hands-on activities that really have these, these engineering components. Generation Science Standard says about engineering design is that um, it, uh, I need to move this so I can look at it. So that engineering is about defining um, problems in terms of criteria for success and constraints or limit. It isn't just free play, right? So as kids get older, instead of saying, well, no more play, what we can do is really create problems and, and help them define problems that are clear, that use uh, academic language, the language of the science they're learning, the language of mathematics, and talk about what criteria for success is. And obviously constraints. The heart of creativity in engineering is constraints. And there are always constraints in engineering. There's never enough time, there's never enough money, you know, the, 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 everything works against you finishing the job. Um, in a classroom, teachers can set constraints very tightly, and maybe that's how you start your engineering projects, is to set tight constraints, constraints and very specific criteria. But then as time goes on, you expand those. So kids have more of a say in what is a, is a successful project. And how, how are we going to define these projects so, so that, you know, we're working with the real world? Um, it says that de designing these solutions means generating a number of possible solutions, evaluating them. And this brings in this iterative design methodology where you're not just step marching kids through a worksheet and just because they get to step 10, means they success, successfully completed the project. Kids should have time to be able to say, you know, I thought this was a good idea, but now that I started working on it, it's not such a good idea. And this is tough in classrooms where time is the most valuable commodity. And then you want to be able to optimize these solutions. Things that are systematic and tested and refined, meaning if you're testing something, how are you testing it? Are you using the tools of science class? Uh, sensors, probes, measurements, a ruler. I mean, how do you test what you've created systematically, methodically, uh, and, and mathematically and scientifically? Um, how are you trading off your design constraints? You know, not everything, what, just as one person thinks something is good doesn't mean another person thinks something is good. You have to help students understand what those um, trade-offs look like in the real world. And, you know, one of the things that we talk to students about is solving problems for the good of the world. And talking about, is something good for everyone? Is everything, you know, is any solution good for anyone? And, and how that comes about. So, uh, Mitch, next slide. There are a couple of engineering curriculum that are widespread, used all over the United States at least. Um, I think there's a, and I'm going to show, uh, you know, a couple of these and then just refer you to resources because we don't have time to go through all of them. There are a lot of good engineering curriculum and a lot of them acknowledge the problem that we don't have time for a whole other class. So they create units that work in science class and, you know, all kinds of different formats. Element, engineering is elementary is one. This is out of the Boston uh, Science Museum. It's absolutely fantastic. It wraps in writing and, you know, all kinds of other things. There's great materials um, and you can buy it in pieces. So you can kind of like pick and choose what you need for, for and they also do professional development. Uh, Mitch, next. Project Lead the Way is another one that's very well known. This actually goes a, a much a wider age range. Uh, they also, understand that you can't always have, you know, a four-year scope sequence of, of engineering uh, courses. Um, you can pick and choose from this. You can get professional development. It's all very well done. Um, a lot of people start with these kind of canned curriculums and then decide how to branch off and, and, and do their own. Um, this is a slide where I'm just going to, you know, we can just go right real fast through it. Um, Mitch, next. 
Um, Engineer Your World is out of the University of Texas, Austin. MIT has open courseware. Pitsco, which is the Lego company, you know, Lego uh, school supply uh, company in, in the United States. Um, change the Equation, Teach Engineering. They have varying kinds of, of curriculum. Some of these are simply databases of lesson plans. Um, you know, that's a little hard to deal with sometimes because you'll get one that's very detailed, one that's very prescriptive, one that's very open-ended, you know, different time lengths. It's, it, it, you know, it's, it's, it's a mixture of, of good. But there are actually many, many resources online that you can look at. Um, next, Mitch. I think, though, if you can, it's worth it to think about creating your own engineering curriculum. The process of designing curriculum actually kind of mirrors the process of design that the kids need to go through. It makes you stronger. It makes you more able to understand the relationship between what you're teaching the kids and your existing curriculum. Um, and, you know, all of these things, it's funny, I wrote these bullets and I looked at them and was like, are those bullets for the kids or for the teachers? And you know what? It's both. I think that iterative design is imperative that students have time to do things in their classroom um, and then keep going and try them again. But so do teachers. You know, the, the worst thing that could happen is you try something once and go, okay, well, that didn't work. Um, you know, another mistake is to throw everything away. You don't have to start new. There's a lot of ways to take um, science projects and, and things that are happening in math class, things that are happening in community science fairs, and transform them into things that have more engineering applications. You have to have time, and you have to be able to work with other people. Um, there's a lot of models to use when you do this. Next slide, Mitch. Um, the engineering is, el is elementary design process. You know, you don't have to buy their curriculum to go online and look at the great uh, process that they use and try and incorporate it into what you do. If you look at all of these, you'll see Design thinking, lag pond kindergarten. We have one in our book, Invent to Learn, called Think, Make, Improve. These are all iterations. They're all asking students to think carefully about what they do, look closely as they're doing it, and then hopefully, if, if the project is meaningful, they'll want to contribute their own ideas and keep going. So all of these ideas can, can, be, can be combined into creating your own engineering curriculum. So next slide, Mitch. I think the, oops. That, sorry, no, because I was looking at that and I'll tell you the thing that keeps on going through my mind as you're going through that is, um, you know, I, if, if I'm a teacher and I already have a really full plate, uh, not just for my mm -hmm. students, but my own time, and mm -hmm. the idea of adding that and coming up with a curriculum seems to me, uh, you know, beyond what I, I in, be, beyond what I could do. So, mm -hmm. how would I, as a teacher, approach administration and say, you know, um, I'd like to uh, create a curriculum for engineering for my class? Let's say I'm a, an elementary school I'm an elementary school mm -hmm. teacher. Um, how do I, how would I approach administration and get time to do that? What, what would I use to justify it? Well, I think that if, if people are serious about this idea of STEM, you've got to say, we're doing big S, big M, you know, little t, no e. And it's like, there's nothing pulling this all together. In the real world, mathematics and science are intertwined. And when people invent things, they use the engineering process to make to make that happen. There are very few people, you know, uh, like the, the Sheldons of the Big Bang Theory. There are very few jobs like this where you sort of sit in an ivory tower and just think great thoughts. Most of the time, you have to make something. You have to make a product. You have to make a plan. You have to work with other people. Um, all of these skills are part of the engineering process and you know when you when you look at resources like the next generation science standards and you say the next generation science standards are insisting that engineering be part of the process 
So if we're not looking at our science curriculum and saying, where's the engineering? We're doing the kids a disservice. We're really not looking at the way modern science works. We're just relying on the past and saying, okay, well, the text, you know, it's, it's 11th grade. Everybody must be in chemistry. And we've always taught chemistry the same. And we just buy the new revised textbook and we just go through it. I think that if you're engaged in a thoughtful process of looking at your curriculum and trying to adapt in a way that works in the modern world, I think you have to look at, just absolutely have to look at some of these things. And you know what? Maybe some things have to go. And, and, and we're not, I don't think we're necessarily talking, or we're definitely not talking about designing a full semester curriculum in engineering in this process, but it could be as little as, you know, uh, give me the, give me three hours with other teachers so that we can design two or three engineering projects that we can all do. Absolutely. You know, so being that, realistic about really the time you have, you know, you're absolutely right. Being realistic about the time you ask. But, you know, I think you have to also be honest about the time that's being wasted on things that could be engineering that are pretending to be engineering. I mean, uh, I can t give you a great example. The, the every February it's Engineers Week. Schools all across the United States have an egg drop. And if you blindfolded everyone and looked at the projects, it would be hard to tell kindergarten egg drop projects from twelfth grade egg drop projects, right? Mm -hmm. Right. They're just an idea of and and just a feeling, and it's like, well, we got to protect the egg, and here we go. So the engineering process says what's the problem we're trying to solve? What do we know? What can we, what can we you know, do to help solve this problem in a more methodical way, in a way that's, that creates um, measurement, create, is predictable, allows us to analyze results, and that can be a conversation. So if you're already doing an egg drop, and it just takes a couple of meetings of the science teachers to get together and say, what should a third grader understand about the physics of motion, the, the material properties of protecting the egg? What should they understand and what should they be able to articulate? What should they be able to design? Not just throw something together, but design methodically um, and be able to defend why this design is, is better than a different design. That's starting to get into the engineering process. And the fifth grade teachers should be able to do the same thing and say, you know what, the kids now know um, how to how to multiply. They know how to uh, take pictures. They know how to, you know, measure velocity because we did a project on that in some in, in some other way. And maybe that's fifth grade, maybe it's eighth grade, whatever it is. But um, you should be able to add these mathematics that that the kids are should be able to do, and the science that the kids should know into these real world projects instead of everything being completely disconnected. So if you go okay. to the next slide, actually, I've got an yep. example of something like that. So here's an example of a project that's this, this particular, these pictures were, were done, uh, were taken in a, in a, you know, in an elementary school setting. Um, building insulated boxes, refrigerator. So at, at a certain age, you know, maybe even like kindergarten, very young elementary, kids should be able to understand that, that some materials have thermal properties. Of course, you use age appropriate language. Um, they should be able to, to ask questions like, how long will it take ice to melt? And be able to use their, their understanding of time to say, is two hours longer than, than you know, 100 minutes? Ask questions like that. Maybe ask each other questions like that. Um, and then at every grade level, you should be able to increase the kind of scientific and mathematical um, quest, you know, expectations of this kind of project, even if you're doing the same project. I mean, you could have the kids making refrigerators out of recycled materials at kindergarten, third grade, fifth grade, twelfth grade, but the engineering practice is very different because of the expectations of what the kids know about math and science. So instead of saying this is extra, this should be incorporated into um, the science and math time 
where instead of doing paper and pencil work about measurement, kids are actually measuring things. Instead of doing paper and pencil work about, you know, temperature differences or, you know, um, converting Celsius to Fahrenheit and things like that, that happens because they're being asked to measure. And maybe you give them thermometers in Celsius. You know, maybe that's a teacher decision that you give them instruments that aren't quite right for the job and let them figure out what else they need. So these kinds of engineering tasks, engineering isn't always about building a brand new building or a rocket ship or something. Some this is just about understanding the world that you live in. And I think that's where you pick up a lot of synergy with existing math and science that's being done almost completely with paper and pencil. So next, in the next slide. Um, the added benefit to this is that there's, there's a lot of research that shows that these real world experiences are what interests girls in science, but keeps girls interested in science. And it's not just girls that, that you know, um, are interested in real world application. Kids that aren't the, the ones who are going to get good grades in science class might very well be the ones who could build something that's extremely sophisticated that shows that they understand the same kinds of, of, of understandings. So, you know, this is a way to really bring engineering um, to a whole group of, of students who aren't traditionally thought of as being, well, you know, girls aren't engineers and, and uh, you know, there are some people just aren't good at math. That's a way to dispel those myths by doing real world things. Um, so let me, let, let's go to the next slide and let me talk about a, a, a school that I was just at last week called Science Leadership Academy. And uh, what, they, what they do is they design an engineering class for their ninth grade. So there's a mandatory class that every ninth grader has to take. It's semester long. So half the, you know, half the ninth graders do it the first semester, half do it the second semester. And then um, they actually have a four-year pathway where students can take four years of engineering. Now, only about percent of the students, um, sorry, not, not even 10%, it's a, it was about uh, 16 students who graduated who were actually thinking about going into engineering as a profession. But the reason they ask every ninth grader to do it is because it's kind of a Trojan horse. It's kind of a sneaky way to all the kids do like a design boot camp. Because the school is based on design and project-based learning in every uh, course, from Spanish class to history class, it's all, all about projects. So they use mandatory semester-long uh, ninth grade engineering course as a way to teach the kids how to use the design process, whether you're writing an essay or, you know, building, a, a designing a monument to, to represent a historical figure. All of that applies. Um, and then a few kids become interested in, you know, engineering and they go through a more rigorous engineering process. So I think that's, a, that's an interesting kind of sneaky way to think about engineering as a design boot camp. And if you're a school who's like, we're a project-based learning school, well, when are the kids learning to do that? Um, when, are you, when are you explicitly talking to them about the design process, which would work for any class? So I'll show one more slide from SLA, it's the next slide. Um, their engineering process has these uh, five components, inquiry, research, collaboration, presentation, reflection. And you'll see if you compare those to the engineering design processes of engineering as elementary or project lead the way, you would see these same kinds of ideas. The thing is, is that they invented it for themselves. They live and breathe this motto. And when the kids walk into the school on the first day, they start teaching it to the to, to every student. And they, they call it engineering, but I think it's a lot more than that. Um, let's skip forward two slides, Mitch. One more. So this is a, 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 some notes that uh, the, the engineering teacher at the Science Leadership Academy shared with me. He had a bunch of local businesses come in, engineering companies, very high-tech companies, 
Um, and he asked them, what do you value in employees? You know, and none of them said like, memorize it. We know this, right? They value communication, writing, um, creativity, being able to work in a group, um, you know, just being fearless to sort of jump into a problem even if you weren't really sure how to solve it. These are the kinds of things that you want to focus in on when you're thinking about how to squeeze engineering in, um, you know, to a program. Because you want this for all kids. You want them to be fearless about solving a problem in Spanish or in, in uh, you know, a, 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 a sewing class or in music theory or any class that they take. Um, and these are the kinds of things that you don't have to teach in a vacuum. You don't have, a, have to have a, a class called um, you know, grit, where you teach kids about grit. Kids learn these things by doing things that are difficult and succeeding at them. And I think that's the heart of creating engineering opportunities that exist inside the curriculum. So let's see, we're getting towards the end. Um, this is an, if you look at this, this web link, this is another example of a school, a middle school, that decided they wanted to have um, three weeks. They sort of rearranged their schedule and they made a big intercession um, where the kids did an engineering challenge. And so all the staff came together and figured out how they were going to do this. And it's a really interesting blog post because it talks about their design process, what they tried, threw it away, tried a second time, plan B, plan C and got something that they felt was extremely useful for their students in a three-week session that only happens for the seventh graders once a year. Um, did they have to rearrange the whole schedule? No. Did they have to throw away science? No. But they figured out how to make it work in their school uh, in the time they had. So if you go one more slide, I just want to talk about something that I think is super important when you're, when you're um, looking at engineering is that especially in elementary school there are many many teachers who worry about their own ability in math and science they feel like you know they're not good at math they really don't have a scientific mind how can they teach kids about engineering and i think this is a serious issue that schools have to address if they're trying to move engineering into the curriculum you know in an elementary school you can't just say well, some expert is going to come into the classroom and it's going to be, you know, a pull out and kids are going to build a bridge and then that's it. We've done engineering. I think schools need to think carefully about how to help teachers overcome their own anxiety about math and science and their own feelings of, you know, I, that's not what I did well in school. And, uh, you know, honestly, when when we do our professional development, a lot of it is about building teachers' confidence, self-confidence by actually doing things and then inspecting them and going, this was really a complex thing and you thought it through. And they're like, oh, no, I'm not that smart. But you know what? When they have these experiences with new technology and, you know, uh, microcontrollers and programming and things like that, a lot of teachers feel that they've recaptured some of their own power to push through these kinds of worries that they have. Um, so uh, if, we, if, if you want to start to wrap up, um, I just want to talk about a couple opportunities that are coming up for people uh, in professional development. Uh, we do have a four-day summer institute where we, we, we talk about a lot of these things and teachers come and work on long-term projects that really showcase engineering skills and engineering design. Um, and then, you know, how to take that back to the classroom. This year we have another powerhouse lineup of speakers. It's constructingmodernknowledge.com. Uh, I invite you to take a look and perhaps uh, if you can come to New Hampshire for four days, it's a lot of fun and uh, you'll learn a lot. Um, if you want to just put up the last slide, that's my, my uh, contact information. I'm happy to talk to people about how you might make this happen in your school. Um, and, uh, you know, tweet me, email me, that's all fine. So we have a couple minutes left, Mitch, if you want to uh, have a little more conversation, that would be terrific. Sure. So I'm going to, you know, I'll, I'll ask you um, a, a question. And again, if you, um, 
if you're participating tonight and you'd like to ask a question, uh, click on that ask button and they'll pass the question on. Uh, the the uh, or raise your hand uh, and I'll bring you up and you can ask your question and discuss it directly. Um, so just what what are uh, just a couple of your uh, favorite projects that you've seen schools or or kids do? Oh gosh, there's there's so many. You know, I, know. I think a, a lot of schools a lot of schools are doing really good projects that with just a little bit of tweaking on um, uh, would really become a, a lot more engineering based you know mm -hmm. adding that asking the kids to do more analysis to do more measurement um to add a little ambiguity to instead of giving kids you know the pieces of the kit to put together letting them you know sort of have to find the pieces and and develop their own ideas about um, a robot car or, you know, something that, that moves, um, you know, there, there are, there, you know, I, I get stuck on this because there's no one right answer. Right. You know, right. every school has different stuff. Every school has, is in a different community, has a different set of kids, expectations. I mean, there, there are schools who are starting from a very project-based uh, base, but it, the projects tend to be um, talking about things or designing things, but never really getting precise measurements or building a prototype or, you know, everything's just sort of loose and imaginary. Well, push yourself. Try and make a real thing. You know, an imaginary invention always works. <laughs> you know, a, a real invention ha has to be a lot simpler because making things work is hard. But that's the heart of engineering. You know, so I would I would ask what we're already doing, what we do well, and then try and add that mathematics, that that and that analyzing measurement precision to to existing projects. I've noticed you know, that you don't have to go out and buy a whole bunch of new stuff. Right. Now I've noticed that sometimes the, the projects are done in the context of a classroom, but sometimes that they're done in the context of let's say the library. Which is being, which could be transformed into a way of sharing resources or um, cross-disciplinary projects. What are your thoughts on this? On uh, engineering being a function of a, a library operation versus within a classroom? Well, you know, librarians have really jumped onto the maker movement. A lot of maker spaces are being run by by librarians. I think the libraries have a lot of affordances that are actually very good. Um, they tend to be cross-grade, they're cross-curricular, um, they have a lot more flexibility in time. You know, you can have a project that's a day or a week or a month or, you know, and, and there's a librarian there. You know, librarians are there to help kids make sense of the world and to make things. And I think if, if maybe they partner with, with, you know, a math teacher or a science teacher or an engineering teacher, um, they could probably come up with some really interesting projects for, for kids to do. I think that, you know, there are a lot of libraries that really do have strong technology programs, um, especially when there are students who are leading it. You know, students who may, may become an expert in one particular piece of technology, and then they can help other teachers. So the librarian doesn't have to, like, learn how to use Arduinos or learn how all the robots work. You can have students who are doing that. And that not only is, is efficient, it carries a cultural message that we believe students are competent. We believe students are the leaders in, in, how, in how they learn and how we all learn as a community. And I think that's, that's super important. So I, I think it's a great place, great idea. Yeah. OK. Um, so we're, we're, we're really just um, a little bit past the hour now. So I guess, um, you know, where, where would people be, see you, I guess, where are you going to be over the next month? Because I know you speak all over the country and even all over the Gosh. world. Um, I'm going to be in Calgary uh, uh, one week from today, the Calgary City Teachers Convent, uh, Conference, uh, doing two hands-on workshops, one in wearables, so I mentioned that before, wearable technologies. Um, 
right after that, I'll be in San Francisco at the Learning in the Brain conference on February 17th. I'm going to Australia uh, at wow. the end of the month, and then Hong Kong for the 21st Century Learning Conference in Hong Kong. Um, and then I'm then I'm back, so that'll be wow. good. Wow, lots lots of travels. Okay, well, thank you for yeah. taking the time tonight, and uh, no we'll be posting the archive as well. And uh, mm -hmm. I'm sure uh, we'll see each other at future conferences and online and Facebook and Twitter and wherever else we see each other, right? Absolutely. And, and, and thanks, everybody, who participated today and are watching online in the future. So, <laughs> hello from <Okay>. the past. <laughs> <laughs> thanks, Mitch. <laughs> okay. Well, thank you. And uh, hope to see you all on uh, February uh, 16th. Uh, on where we're going to be teaching argumentation, or we're going to be showing how to teach argumentation with Kathy Glass. And this is Mitch Weisberg signing off for EdChat Interactive. Good night.